Well, thank you very much to the conference organisers in this massive transfusion consensus conference for allowing me to present by uh, video link rather than being present. Um, it's a long way to travel to, to, talk to, to talk for only 15 minutes and it didn't seem to be a good use of the global environment. So my job is to talk about what's the role for tranexamic acid and um, I was asked to talk about my conflict of interests, first of all. I think this is very important. I'm going to be talking about the CRASH-2 trial. It was funded by the UK National Institute for Health Research, which is the kind of equivalent, British equivalent of the NIH. Um, the pilot study was funded by some charitable trusts, and drug and placebo was provided by Pfizer. And apart from, uh, well, it, it's a publicly funded trial, so I don't think I've got uh, any great conflict of interest of here. But I do think conflict of interests are important. Uh, in 2006, I um, ended up in the newspapers after I cautioned on the use of a drug called activated factor 7A in British servicemen. This drug has been extensively promoted through the medical literature um, often by doctors with some sort of financial affiliation with the company that makes it. The current evidence from randomized controlled trials is that it has no mortality benefit, but probably increases the risk of arterial thrombotic events. So we're using a very expensive drug without any evidence of benefit in the presence of clear harms. And that's only possible because doctors have lost sight of the patient's interest. And they've lost sight of the patient's interest because their snouts are in the trough of industry funding. And I think it's a sad thing for, uh, for doctors and for research in general. So conflict of interests are important. Now, massive transfusion is the uh, title of today's conference. But, uh, I've never found it a very useful concept for many reasons. First, you're defining a group of people by the therapy they've received and not their characteristics. Well, that's not very useful. It's unclear even whether the therapy itself is effective. Actually, it sounds surprising, but we don't know what the patient benefits are from giving large volumes of blood or other blood products. It's an arbitrary dichotomy of what's inherently a continuous measure, the amount of blood someone receives. And it provides the wrong focus on heroic, non-evidence-based therapy. And it may be related to this um, heroic, non-evidence-based therapy, activated factor 7A, and all the silly nonsense that surrounded that treatment. The focus, clearly, should be on finding effective treatments for bleeding patients. And the only way to do that is to do randomized controlled trials. Um, it's the time-honored way of finding out safe and effective treatment for patients, and it applies to bleeding patients just like it applies to any other patient. So with that in mind, um, we'll turn our attention to tranexamic acid, which is a synthetic derivative of the amino acid lysine. Um, that's got a high affinity for the lysine binding sites of plasminogen and blocks those sites, preventing the binding of plasmin to fibrin surface, uh, thus having an antifibrinolytic effect. It's a drug that's been around for about 50 years. It's actually sold over the counter for women with heavy periods. It's, um, it's uh, well established and it's got a good safety profile. The reason we started looking at it in trauma patients is that there was very clear evidence that it was safe and effective in elective surgery. So tranexamic acid is often used in elective surgery because it reduces the need for blood transfusion. This slide shows that it reduces the need of trans for transfusion by about a third and there's a non-significant reduction in mortality. So the reduction in mortality is non-significant because there isn't much death in elective surgery, and so the studies are underpowered. But it's very encouraging. On the other hand, in trauma, there is a lot of death. Um, many trauma patients bleed to death, 
And so we've got a drug, tranexamic acid, reduces bleeding and the need for blood transfusion. It seemed a reasonable proposition to see if it reduces hemorrhage mortality in trauma patients. And so this is what we did. We conducted a, a trial called CRASH-2, which is a randomized placebo-controlled trial among trauma patients with significant hemorrhage of the effects of tranexamic acid on death and vascular occlusive events and a number of other outcomes. And this, was, this trial was made possible by the, because of the co cooperation of hundreds of doctors around the world, doctors who really want to find out better treatments for trauma patients and know that you have to do randomized controlled trials to do that. And it's a very simple story. 20,211 patients were randomly allocated to get tranexamic acid or placebo. Uh, we had almost complete follow-up of patients with over 99% follow-up. And we looked at the outcomes in the two groups. The treatment was two grams of tranexamic acid, a gram loading dose over 10 minutes, followed by a gram maintenance dose over eight hours. Now I could show you lots of slides of baseline characteristics and uh, this is just one of them. It shows that the two groups were well balanced as it regards to key prognostic factors. I could show you lots of other uh, tables of baseline uh, factors but the, the point is they're well balanced because a large number of patients have been randomized. Now to the results. So we had 10,000 patients allocated to TXA and 10,000 allocated placebo and this is a treatment that reduces bleeding. So we hope that we'd get less bleeding mortality in the tranexamic acid allocated patients. And we do. There was a 15% reduction in the relative risk of death due to bleeding that was highly statistically significant. Of course, when, whenever you do anything uh, to reduce the risk of bleeding, you're worried that it will increase the risk of thrombotic side effects of vascular occlusive events. But fortunately, in this case, there was no increase in vascular occlusion with tranexamic acid. In fact, there was a small decrease that wasn't statistically significant. There was a non-significant reduction in multi-organ failure, uh, no effect on head injury or other outcomes. But all in all, there was a near enough a 10% uh, relative reduction in the risk of death, uh, all-cause mortality with tranexamic acid that was highly statistically significant. So this is a very important result because it's a cheap, widely practicable treatment that can be easily given in hospitals all around the world and it reduces the risk of dying by at least 10%, all-cause mortality. So there we have the result again. Uh, highly significant reduction in all-cause mortality. Now, you're always worried that a treatment that uh, reduces the risk of dying might leave patients with severe disabilities, but this was not the case here. We had less death and more good outcome. So as you can see from this slide, there was a statistically significant reduction in mortality and a statistically significant increase in the number of patients who are discharged from hospital with no symptoms. So that's a good thing. So this is one of the first patients uh, to be treated with tranexamic acid. This is a patient in Peru who'd been shot and he's been treated with tranexamic acid because the doctor treating him was a participant in the CRASH-2 trial, one of the co-authors on the paper, and so he knew the result before anybody else. Now, there's always a focus after you've presented the trial results on subgroup analysis, and a number of subgroup analyses were conducted. There was, it didn't make any difference. The effect of the trial treatment was the same in patients who had blunt and penetrating trauma. It was the same irrespective of blood pressure at arrival. It was the same irrespective of Glasgow coma scale at arrival. The only significant subgroup effect was related to time since the injury on the risk of death due to bleeding. So this is the effect of tranexamic acid on the risk of death due to bleeding according to time from injury. Now the overall result was a 15% reduction in the risk of death due to bleeding.
If the treatment was given within one hour, however, there was a much larger reduction in the risk of death due to bleeding. So an almost 30% reduction in the risk of death due to bleeding. If it was given between one and three hours, there was a 20% reduction in the risk of death due to bleeding. And if it was given after three or four hours, there was actually an increase in the risk of death due to bleeding. Now, we can't really explain the increase. We asked a lot of trauma and coagulation experts uh, before seeing the results, if they thought this result was plausible, and they couldn't find any plausible explanation. And it could be a fluke, because subgroup analyses are vulnerable to the play of chance. But what isn't a fluke is that early treatment is more effective. So what these results show is that you need to treat patients with tranexamic acid as soon as possible. The other subgroup analysis that we conducted for this presentation is the effect on, of tranexamic acid on the risk of death due to bleeding by geographical location. Now, people often say to us, OK, the CRASH-2 trial was conducted uh, in hospitals in low- and middle-income countries. It wasn't only, but many of them were. Um, and those results won't apply to a high-income country like Canada or the United States. I see no basis for that um, assumption. It seems to me a little bit more like a prejudice than anything else. Um, but this analysis looks at the effect of tranexamic acid by geographical region. So the, the, the regions were Asia, um, Latin America, Africa, Europe, and North America. And there's no significant difference in the effect of the treatment according to region. Now, I've just called them regions here in this figure. Uh, but um, Europe and North America, I can give you a clue. You can work out what region it is if I told you that there were the fewest hospitals participating in Europe and North America. As you can see, the effect of tranexamic acid on death due to bleeding was also apparent there. Now, we had a whole range of uh, baseline risks in the crash, amongst the patients in the CRASH-2 trial. And this slide shows that graphically. So some patients had a, quite a high risk of death, but the majority of patients had a, had a modest risk of death, something between about 0 and, 0 and 5, 10%. So if we show that in this pie chart, about 80% of patients, their risk of death was between about 0 and 10%, but we had some patients with 10 to 20% risk, and 10% of patients had a risk of death greater than 20%. When we focus on heroic concepts like massive transfusion, we tend to shift our attention to the patients at very high risk of death. But that's probably inappropriate. I'm going to talk now about deaths avoided according to baseline risk. So this shows baseline risk, those categories I've shown earlier. Clearly, patients at high risk are at high risk of death. The important thing, however, is that the absolute number of deaths is also quite high amongst low-risk patients. In other words, low-risk patients are at low risk of dying, but there's a lot of them. So there, was, there is a lot of deaths among low-risk patients. And, and you can see that in this illustration. So 188 deaths in the high-risk group, but 126 and 119 in the low and medium risk. And so these are the numbers of deaths that would be avoided from using tranexamic acid. Because a very important point is that there's no evidence that the effect of tranexamic acid varies according to baseline risk of death. So the effect of tranexamic acid is the same in all these groups. So here we show the percentage of deaths avoided in each, of these two, in each of these three groups. So if we only focused on the high-risk group, we would avoid 43% of the avoidable mortality. But if, we f but if we focused on, but we miss more than half of the benefit by focusing on that high-risk group. Now, one argument for focusing on a high-risk group is, is that is sometimes made is that there's a more favorable balance of risks and benefits. So 
Um, the absolute benefit is greater with, at high risk and the, the side effects are constant. That's often uh, the case. But in this case, there are no documented side effects. This shows the risk of vascular occlusive events by baseline risk. And as you can see, there was actually a reduction in the risk of vascular occlusive events with tranexamic acid. And that reduction seemed to apply to patients with low, middle, and high risk of death. So there's no rational reason for restricting this treatment to patients who are at very high risk of death. Now let's, for the sake of argument, look at this issue of massive transfusion. Now, we try to use a criteria of massive transfusion um, in this case, people that had more than four units of blood and who had a systolic blood pressure less than 90. Strictly speaking, this is not a valid analysis because um, how much blood someone received is a factor that comes after randomization. So you shouldn't do subgroup analysis on post-randomization factors. So bear that in mind. But it's illustrative for this conference that first patients with massive, massive transfusion are a small minority, 5% of the patients. Most patients did not have massive transfusion. Second, that the effect of tranexamic acid is the same in those who have massive transfusion and, and who don't have massive transfusion. But the important point is here again we have massive transfusion patients are at high risk of dying not massive transfusion patients are at lower risk of dying, but the important point is here. Most deaths are in patients who do not have massive transfusion. So if we only focused on patients who had massive transfusion, we would only avoid about 16% of the total deaths we could avoid from using tranexamic acid. So in summary, Tranexamic acid safely reduces mortality in bleeding trauma patients. It should be given early, as soon as possible, ideally within three hours of injury. It's probably uh, not particularly effective, possibly even harmful when given after that period. It should be given to all patients with significant bleeding. This focus on massive transfusion is inappropriate. We should prevent patients needing massive transfusion by treating bleeding trauma patients early with tranexamic acid. I think this is a serious concern at the moment because tranexamic acid is being included in so-called massive transfusion protocols, whereas it should be included in trauma protocols. And one of the last questions that I was asked to address is what should be the goal of therapy? And that's an easy one. The goal of therapy is to make patients better and so we need randomized controlled trials that have patient relevant endpoints as the outcome and we should not base patient treatment decisions on consensus among people who know something about theory. It might be a good basis for doing a trial but it's a very poor basis for treating patients. We, what we need is randomized controlled trials. The CRASH-2 trial has shown that these trials are possible. Thank you very much.